Hello, this is a perennial wildflower border at the uh, west end of Tayport and we're going to dig up some bits and pieces to take back to the Tayport community garden to create a wildflower corner or the wildflower nuke as we're going to call it. As you can see from here we've got a vast diversity, much much better than the grass sward back in the garden. Got hard heads, got yarrow, got ladies bed straw, oxide daisies, vipers buglus, just to name a few. So when we get them back to the garden we'll show you how to divide and plant them into an existing sward. See you later. Hello everybody, welcome to the uh, Tayport Community Garden for the wildflower workshop today. Now the one thing that we noticed about the top end of the garden is when we were working with the primary school children to see how many different kinds of flowers they could find, there was definitely a lack of diversity in there. So we're going to try and plant some more in the way of plants which are going to help the pollinators create a bit more diversity. And because it's a corner up there, we're going to call it the biodiversity nuke. And we have had wildflower plantings already in the garden, but that tended to have been annuals which is actually quite pretty, it helps pollinators, but it's difficult to sustain. Whereas this will be the perennial plants, which hopefully will set seed into the sward, and then we'll have a certain amount of regime of how we manage it thereafter. So that would be another workshop. So once you've all had a nice hot drink, and it's fairly cold, so we need to get active, yeah. we'll go up and give you a bit of a demonstration about what's required today. Kashka and I went down to the um, wildflower, the perennial wildflower border which has been so successful down at the roundabout at the west end of the town and dug up some of the plants there. That will be quickly filled in and so that means that we've got a, a germ, if you like, of material to put into this sward here which Frank managed to strim down really quite hard back and raked up and Ian helped to gather it all up and put it on the pumpkin patch. And we've done it oh, some uh, last Thursday, was in your mind. Right, that's true, we did some last Thursday. Too. Good. So the first thing to do is um, we'll assert you, assort you into groups to do various tasks. Now the first one to do is to get the plants into the ground before we put the bulbs in. Anybody like to have a guess why? Because if you put the bulbs in the ground, then you come along to put the wild flowers in, you might dig the bulbs up again. So, first thing to do is to get a clump of the stuff that we dug up, and as you can see it's all matted and clumped together, but we want to divide it. And depending on the plant species, there's various different ways to do this. Now then, what we have here is three different kinds of plant, I think. We've got oxide daisy, which roots as it goes. So even putting bits like this into the ground at this time of year would act almost like cuttings. And I'll show you how to plant them in a minute. The next one, which is why we have the secateurs, is um, very carefully, just, it's actually quite tough try and cut your way through in order to extract a small piece of the wildflower plug. And this one here is red campion. It's got a lovely red pinkish flower and flowers for quite a long season as well. So there's two different kinds. This one here again is red campion, but it's also mixed up with the oxide daisy. So again, separation yeah. would be useful. This one here is yarrow. And this clump will make us at least three, even, again, using the secateurs, four clumps. And we have a beautiful little orange daisy here called the orange hawkweed. Uh, again, quite a long flowering season. Good one for seeds for finches. So anyway, there are more different types, but we must crack on and show you what actually to do. So as I say, wildflowers first. 
So if you take your fork, which you've carefully put in the ground, of course, and just bend it back, maybe a bit deeper. And then you see a small amount of soil showing. Then you can put your plant in like that and literally just stamp it closed. And at this time of year, it's, there's still a certain amount of warmth in the soil and there's a long season until it wants to start growing again, by which time the root system will have re-established underneath the ground. So that's how to put the wildflowers in. We've also got bulbs. These are some of our narcissus left over from last year's bulb lasagnas that we do. So rather than throw them away, we'll give them a chance to flower in this area. Now, you can do the same again by prising back the soil to make a crack and then putting the bulb in. But we've got a bulb planter with us. Two different types of bulb planter. This is one that you can operate by foot, by pressing down on it. The ground's very spongy here. Twist it and remove it. And then you have a nice deep hole because the narcissus require a nice deep hole to put them in. Rather than push this plug back out, use it again. I think I might do this because it's kind of tough. And you lift the old plug off and pop it back in. And then this is the hand bulb planter, which might be a bit tricky. A twisting motion. Actually, that's almost easier. And the same for coming out again. Another bulb. See, these have got roots on, so they really needed to get in the ground. Pop it in. Put the plug on top. And then we've got a range of, again, pollinator-friendly bulbs. This will give us a lovely splash of colour in the spring. It's a small crocus. And the idea is that you come, take a pot, take a selection of all the bulbs, because they don't have to go in so deep. So you could actually lift the whole bit back and then just that's the, the larvae of a swift moth uh -huh. Uh -huh. Mm. this is sometimes called a dock and grub and you'll find that sometimes they attack parsnips so we'll leave it for a hungry robin to find. We've also got snake's head fritillary bulbs. Mm -hmm. Now because this area can be prone to being very damp, this is a wonderful plant to have in here because its natural habitat in places like Gloucestershire is wetland fens. Mm -hmm. Again, quite a small bulb, so it doesn't need to go deep at all. And again, use the fork to prize back and just pop them in. So there we go. Any any questions? So what's the advantage of uh, having um, early flowering bulbs in the uh, lawn? Or? That's a loaded question from Kashka. <laughs> to more or less point out the idea that we're doing this so that early emerging queen bumblebees that have overwintered can have a source of nectar and pollen which will provide them with the energy they need to start a new colony. Mm. And <clears throat> there's a succession of different timings as well, mm. so that that will help. Anybody else? Mm. What about traditional... I don't, I, when, I, when you say Scottish wildflowers, I think of uh, primroses and the harebells, the bluebells. Would we, is there an advantage in planting those? Definitely, and um, this is by no means a finished product yeah. today. Uh -huh. okay. It can be a very much an ongoing situation because 
what we'll find over the years is that various plants will dominate and take over and others will begin to fade and it's um, in, in ecology terms it's called succession and climax oh, okay. but the thing is that with human intervention we'll always be managing it yeah, yeah. and if we hadn't intervened in this spot would no wildflowers have naturally i mean you know been blown in by the wind or it would have probably turned into a really quite rough sward of very tough grasses. Okay, right. And because they are so aggressive, then other things have difficulty in moving in. We might end up with gorse, for example, or broom, yes. the real, the fighters. Okay. Right, well, let's get cracking. another question. Oh, another Go question. <laughs> also loaded. <laughs> If, um, so we've got quite a lot of uh, flowering plants in the garden that feed a lot of pollinators, which are not native. But what is the advantage of actually planting the native plants over the ones that are not native in well, your garden? Well, obviously the, uh, the evolution of our wildflowers in the insect populations that rely on them have been hand in hand. So for example, bumblebees will have a certain long length of uh, proboscis and um, same with butterflies and moths to fit some of the plants that we've got in the garden and that's a very interesting point because I have here a very good demonstration about how plants and invertebrates can be very much connected this is a plant called sweet rocket and its Latin name is Hesperus and that comes from the Greek for evening because this is a, a plant that only s releases its scent and pollen and nectar in the evenings mm. and therefore has a direct benefit to moths mm. which of then of course can have a direct benefit to bats so there we see from one little plant in a pot mm. you're actually connecting up with an entire ecosystem mm. there are other plants which are a good source of food for the caterpillars as well and after we've done the workshop, we can go and have a look at the books and have a nice warm drink and find out exactly how that works. Anybody getting cold? I am. Yeah. Let's get cracking. Yeah, so, Janice has just found something that she wants to know what it is. Okay. And can you see Under these? The Looks like old school tapioca. Now, I call that slug caviar because in fact it's the eggs of quite a big species of slug and the robin has been flying about over here so if you leave it exposed on the surface the robin will have a nice meal and that will have less slugs in the garden